This is a special presentation. Welcome to the Inside Track, presented by Red Shores. Here is your host, Peter McPhee. Well, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to another edition of the Inside Track uh, here at Red Shores in Charlottetown uh, for a Saturday night. My special guest tonight, and glad to have him, is uh, Peter Smith. Welcome to the uh, broadcast, Peter. Thanks, Pete. Glad to be here. Pete, uh, we want to start off, uh, you've had a long uh, history in the harness racing game, and uh, just uh, your earliest memories of uh, what you remember inside the Smith family for, uh, for horse racing. Uh, Pete, uh, for me there, it started all back in about the mid-70s there when my uh, father Don there got me into the following him around with his horses that he uh, owned back then, and uh, horses like Steady Rosa and, and Sweetie Smith and a few of those old horses there back in the mid-70s, and uh, of course, uh, we'd jump in the car every weekend and head for St. John at that time, or uh, thereabouts uh, with, uh, uh, oh, could be anybody in the car at a given time, but he had horses over there with Francis McIsaac at that time, and uh, so that's where I got my start from there, and uh, uh, started following him around, and been, I guess, probably following around ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Still going. Uh, Pete, uh, Saul's Pride uh, comes to a lot of people's mind when they think of your dad uh, and your uncle, uh, Ian Smith, your dad, Don. Um, that horse really uh, was quite a horse here in the Maritimes, a top-class horse and a, a two-time World Cup winner. What do you remember about uh, the great Saul's Pride? Oh, he was, uh, yeah, he was one of a kind. Uh, Saul, for back in that day, back in those days, back in the uh, early 80s there, of course, uh, Pete, they were flirting around the two-minute mile there yes. back then, and uh, that was the big thing for, for him and uh, those horses that he raced against back then. And uh, uh, and what Saul's pride done for, uh, for us and our family there is uh, gave us many memories, brought us together almost every weekend to follow him around the Maritimes and to... Uh, go to the, the, the biggest races and, uh, of course, uh, brought us many uh, fond memories over the years there. But just a tremendous racehorse, and uh, all around he could race uh, either off the front or from behind, and uh, just a, a super horse that we were fortunate enough to, that we were uh, lucky enough to you know, be able to ha have and, and follow around. And uh, his driver was Joe Smallwood, but uh, I know we've chatted before in the past, uh, Don and uh, your dad Don and myself and you. There's a bit of a story to how Joe Smallwood got to drive this horse. Yeah, the way that, uh, uh, for the most part, how it went there when Dad was buying uh, some horses from New Zealand, Australia, and that, uh, when Saul arrived, uh, he ended up uh, sending him over to uh, Henry Smallwood, Sackville Downs at the time, and uh, Henry got, uh, gave Saul his start and worked him up through the classes at Sackville Downs and won 11, 12 races in a row with him. And, and at that time, Henry had a horse in the free-for-all invitational ranks called Kawiko for yes. Ron McClellan of Bathurst. And uh, so then it came to a point there where he had two horses in the same class. And uh, so I guess Ian and, and Dad and Henry got their heads together and said, well, maybe Brother Joe's the guy for this horse. And, uh, and I think that's how about more or less how the uh, decision came to put Joe on him. And, uh, and uh, the rest is history, that I guess. kind of worked out well. I mean, uh, they called Joe the Fox. And I mean, he could, he could really drive a horse. Yeah. And like Dad always said, if it wasn't for Henry Smallwood, Saul's pride may not have been the horse he was. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them were good for him, Henry and Joe. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, Pete, just touching on, on uh, your ownership uh, involvement in horse racing, why did you want to become an owner? Well, it was sort of a, a bit of a natural flow for me there uh, after, uh, you know, following the races, in, into the race game, with following Dad and Ian and these guys and uh, um, uh, going to the uh, colt sales every year and stuff. And just a sort of a natural progression for me to say, listen, to, uh, I'd like to, you know, to try the ownership and, and try to get involved with one. Uh, I wasn't a trainer, obviously, or a driver, so I said maybe the ownership side is good for me. And uh, so, lo and behold, the first horse that I end up buying into was a horse that Dad actually bred at his firm, uh, at Don Ashton Firms. And Don um, uh, Ashton Magnum was his horse, it, uh, was the name of the horse, uh, a big gene uh, colt, and uh, uh, ended up, uh, uh, that was my first horse, and the uh, first win, uh, first win that I got with that horse. So, uh, and then it went from there, and every year just sort of seemed to go back to the Colt sales, and, and uh, that's where we got our start and, and continue to do so. Yeah, and again, uh, you've uh, really had some great success. Now, you've had um, some similar owners over the years and, and a successful ownership group. Tell me a little bit about them and, and sort of your theory on buying Colts and Phillies at the sale. Well, um, I got we got started there as far as uh, uh, getting into a partnership. Uh, Gerald Morrissey and I first got in partnership together way back with uh, a horse called Don Ashton Eric. And uh, Clarky Smith, who was our trainer at the time for both Gerald and I, uh, said, why don't you guys team up and maybe go to the sale and, and might help out offsetting some expenses and stuff, uh, uh, getting into and buy maybe buying some better yearlings and uh, are looking at maybe buying some potential better yearlings. And 
So we, uh, uh, Gerald and I, done that for a number of years together, and uh, Dad uh, got into a, some of the uh, partnership with horses over the years too. And by doing so, that allowed us maybe to go to the sales and at look at some maybe some of the higher priced ones or maybe the better bred ones, so to speak. Because you never know how they're all going to turn out, as we know. But that gave us sort of that opportunity to maybe buy instead of buying one or possibly two yearlings at the sale, that gave us the opportunity to buy two or three and offset our costs. And then, and over the years, we. Uh, uh, we uh, had other members that part of our group that uh, uh, that came along with us, Larry Chapel and uh, Arnold Hagen, and uh, uh, all all of, all the guys in, in in our group got along just great, and we had the same uh, the same outlook of what we what we were looking for at the yearling sales, and and what we were trying to get out of uh, get out of this uh, horse game as uh, as it was for all of us a hobby. And you had some nice horses over there. We're going to touch on Touch of Lightning in, in just a second. But Aries Mary one is one that comes to my mind, and she had a couple of British Crown wins. Oh, a great mare there. Uh, uh, I don't know for sure if it was in any other barn than Earl Smith's if she would have quite made the race. There's a few stories behind her training, her training regime that she had to go through uh, uh, in her uh, two-year-old year. And Earl can, t Earl can tell you about that someday. But yes, uh, we'll have him on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, she was a great mare, a two-time Breeders Crown winner, and uh, tough, tough mare, and and uh, and done us all proud and. Uh, uh, but that was one that we uh, that sort of stands out for us for sure, and uh, we've had uh, some other ones that we uh, you know felt felt, felt very uh, uh, high about as well. But she's one that she's one of the standouts. Absolutely. Uh, you talked about Earl Smith, and uh, just to touch on Earl and Kenny Arsenal, I think they're two of your two of your go-to guys to develop these these Colts and Phillies you buy. How important have they been for for your ownership group? Oh, very. Uh, oh, the very, uh, very important. Like you know, without uh, Earl and Kenny, uh, I mean, we wouldn't have the horses get to the races to start with. Because uh, our reason, and reason and theory behind it all is, uh, you got to have a good trainer to start with before you get a horse to the racetrack or worry about racing. So we feel in both Earl and Kenny that we got two of the best trainers around, and 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 also besides being two of the best trainers, two two great individuals, and and now have gone to be uh, great friends with us over the years, and. Uh, uh, and now it's uh, we're just happy and, and have great times just being with them. Yeah, and a lot of winners from Kenny and Earl as well. You yeah, talk about the training side, absolutely. but the driving side. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Pete, uh, just want to touch on Touch of Lightning before we let you go. It's been terrific talking to you. Touch of Lightning was such a special horse on the racetrack. What, in your mind, made him stand out to be, be such a horse? Well, a uh, number of things. Like He was a great, a great all-around race horse and tremendous gate speed, as we all remember. But I, th I, th I think as much as anything, his desire to win. He knew where he knew how to get to the winner's circle, and he wanted to win. He, like he, d he just when he had, uh, uh, you know, you you had him up in the race, and which was usually early, uh, but even er and he was around late a lot. But his desire and his will to win a race at at high speed, at high level as well. He is a fast, fast race horse. It's just too bad uh, the injury succumbed him. But uh, he was uh, probably the best horse that we've uh, we've had so far, and uh, uh, um, and he gave us many memories as well. We're going to play a race. Uh, you selected a race from him. 2013 Premier's Pace, just before we play it, and the guys in the control room are going to play that race in just a sec. Pete, what do you remember about the race? Uh, because I think he had the outside that night, did he not? Yeah, left outside, uh, and they were flying out of there. Anthony McDonald and Jill's Barrio had a couple of horses inside, and they were cutting some pretty uh, heavy fractions up front, and uh, Earl was sitting at the back, and I think Brody McPhee moved at the half with Balanchine, and uh, Earl was on his back, and he took him around the upper turn, and then... Uh, as Vance likes to say, that he came out of the clouds that night. <laughs> he certainly <laughs> did. <laughs> and uh, no, he, that was that was our biggest thrill for sure. And uh, win, winning that race, that uh, uh, old home week in the Premier's Pace, I guess it was in 153. And uh, uh, Earl always said that he had a tremendous speed, and uh, and that to, uh, and the new mark that he took that night was uh, was well justified. Well, thank you, uh, Pete, for coming on tonight. We appreciate it. Uh, continued success with your ownership group, and and thanks again for. Not only your ownership group and supporting the industry, but again, uh, Metro Home Building Center, appreciate your support and the racing game. Thank you, Pete, and I appreciate all the good hard work and uh, that you and Lee do up here on the, on the desk. Very well appreciated. Thank you very much to Peter Smith, and uh, here it is, Touch of Lightning 2013 Premier Space. Ben, we're ready for a start. On gate. Here they come for the Premier Space Final. The Rob, big leagues trying to gun, but it's Wild Dragon the favorite. Those two hooking up around the first turn. They barrel Wild Dragon and big league on the outside of a big time early charge at him. 
and Windermere Express got out sprinted. Third is gapping there. Off the turn, Balanchine got away in the fourth position, followed by Lucky Encounter. To the outside goes Touch of Lightning in the back stretch of the trailers, SF Razzmatazz. And it's Burial with Wild Dragon, the favorite up front. Right on the helmet, bump drafting is Big League. It was fired up early as they pass the opening quarter and hit the far turn now. Windermere Express uh, tracks along in third. And from the inside, Balanchine is fourth. It was a 26 and four toward opening fraction. Lucky Encounter is fifth, moving off the turn. And then it's a touch of lightning as they bring them past the grandstand. SF Razamitaz is the trailer. And Barrio's got him seated single file. And it's a wild pace here. Wild Dragon, Barrio grabbing in, looking for a breather. Big League tracking him intently from second. Windermere Express swings around the turn in third. To the outside goes Balanchine off a half of 55 seconds, a demanding pace. Touch of lightning underway from the back, uh, following Balanchine off the turn, down the back stretch, then Lucky Encounter and SF Razmataz losing touch. It's Wild Dragon trying to go coast to coast. Wild Dragon looks very confident here. On the inside, Big League. And on the outside, Balanchine is all out. One, 23 and four. 28 and four, third quarter. Wild uh, Dragon by two. This Dragon's breathing fire. Big League on the inside, second. Balanchine on the outside, third as they turn home. And into the stretch, Wild Dragon by two. Big League out of the pocket, coming at him. They're trying to swarm in. Wild Dragon's all out. Up on the far outside, touch of lightning, swooping them late. Earl Smith, touch of lightning, touch of lightning up in time. Then Big League between them. Balanchine was right there in the photo. 153 flat for touch of lightning. This has been a special presentation. The Inside Track was presented by Red Shores.
Evening's first race pacers and their drivers on the track for post parade. Number one, Fernhill Dynamic is owned by David Kennedy and Ian Smith of Charlottetown, trained by Tom Weatherby. David Dowling drives. Brad Buddy, number two, is owned by Red Pettifall and Ozzy McKay of Moncton, New Brunswick, trained by Emmons McKay, Jill Ferriel. Number three, Pictonian Rush, owned by Boyd McDonald Produce Limited from Crapo and Dan Ross of Belfast, trained by Danny McDonald, Kenny Arsenal. Four is Ten Mile Beach, owned by Brett LeBlanc of New Waterford and Joel LeBlanc of Victoria Mines, Nova Scotia. Brett LeBlanc trains and drives. Five is Fox Valley Riviera, owned by Robbie Hughes of Stratford, trained by Kevin Gillis, Jason Hughes. Hysteria number six, owned by Billy McKinnon, Sandra Webster, and Mickey Gallant. Mickey does the training. Mark Campbell drives. Seven, J.K.'s boy, owned by Leaf, Leslie, and Spencer Wade, trained by Leslie Wade, Corey McPherson in the sulky. Three minutes wagering time on tonight's opener. Time to go to my co-host Peter McPhee to set up a Saturday night. That includes the Drive for Home series with Hillside Chevrolet, Buick, GMC, Cadillac, and Peter, I extremely enjoyed your interview with Mr. Smith. You know what, uh, Vance, uh, going back, uh, talking about Saul's Pride, uh, boy, that's great memories. And when Pete mentioned, he had mentioned to me before about when Saul's Pride was bought by Don and Ian Smith and brought here, uh, they went to Henry Small.